The book of Acts unveils the blueprint for the spiritual structure of the church. It also describes over 59 different operations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In today's classic Bible teaching, my father, Dr. Lester Sumrall, vividly explores the power of the early church, the largest and oldest institution on the face of the earth. And now the fascinating journey begins in the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles contains the blueprint of the spiritual structure of the church. It describes 50 different operations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and fulfills 21 Old Testament prophecies. The book of Acts vividly depicts the authority of the early church and shows how that same power is available to the church today. Now for a fascinating journey through the book of Acts. Here is Dr. Lester Summerall with today's lesson. We're delighted to welcome you to this class. Our people study so that they won't be ignorant. Little children go to school so they can learn to read what other people say and think. Our people take graduate work for professional purposes so that they can make money and so they can know how to live. We, we study because of eternal life. We want eternal life. We want to know the eternal verities of a mighty God. And so we, we, we study because we want to know God. In the book of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, we have before us the blueprint of not only the early church, but the total church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this point, when we are on lesson 10, uh, at, at, at this point uh, in our studies of the Acts of the Apostles, I see no instability in the body. I see only strength in the body as we've gone this far with our studies. I, I, I see the homes together, not running away from each other, not divorces, and, and not hurt in the homes. I see their doctrine solid. They're believing the same thing. You see, this is what makes maturity. This is what makes greatness. I see their organization becoming strong, that they're tightening up and, 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 and their organization is becoming, well, when, when it says they that have turned the world upside down have come hither, you better believe there's some organization there. You know, that kind of thing doesn't happen by accident. And so we're delighted to take you into the first divine deliverance. Uh, we, we have progressed uh, quickly and into this area, it, we're at chapter 5 now. And uh, this divine deliverance, anything that God has done for the church, God will do for the church. And so we're not living on less leftovers of yesterday. We're living on the banquet of today. And all that God has done, God is doing. Amen. Will do, can do. The atmosphere of holiness that had judged Ananias and Sapphira in our last lesson. It attracted multitudes to the church, and it would do the same today. The gift of the discerning of spirits uh, revealed the reality of God to the people, and it cleaned up the church. And, and we maintain that these gifts are going to function the same way, only in a greater quantity in these last days. We, we believe that when we're coming to the end of time, that we're going to see the mightiest manifestation of the Acts of the Apostles the world has ever seen. This powerful endowment of the Spirit in the church in Jerusalem brought an end to sickness, suffering, so that even when Peter's shadow passed over people, they were healed. Now, that's a phenomenon. He didn't even look that way. His shadow, that's what you call living on the right side of the street. Hallelujah. One side of the street doesn't have a shadow, you know. And some people are always on the wrong side, never get the shadow. <laughs> However, the great influx of believers, it alarmed the enemies of the church and the enemies of Jesus. It stirred them to a point of opposition against the church and a persecution. Let us read together from Acts 5, 11. And great fear came upon all the church, 
thank God for that. You could call that word fear, respect. Great respect came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things, that by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That's the reason I spoke of the strength of the church in the beginning here. There was one accord there. And of the rest doth no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes. Say multitudes. multitudes. That's right. Multitudes, both of men and women. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on their beds and their couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. This wonderful demonstration of God's divine power was not well received by religious leaders. I've, I've done missionary work in a hundred nations of the world. It's always the religious leaders that stand up against the missionary. You, you say, why? Well, it's the same devil that's worked from the beginning. He hadn't changed in his disposition. And so the religious leaders, they were indignant because of, well, number one, their offerings would get small and their audience was getting small. And that'll make them angry, you see, because the new people had the people. And, 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 and that's never a pleasant situation for old organizations. In Acts 5 and 16, it says, There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. And then the devil starts operating. He says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sa Sadducees. You remember what we said about the Sadducees? That they were so sad, you see, because they didn't believe in miracles. They, they didn't believe in anything divine or spiritual. They were modernist, and they were liberals, and they, they were sad, as they are still today. And since so they were filled with indignation, these religious leaders, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. It's amazing what envy will do. Uh, when, when, when somebody rises up above us, we, we get all upset about it. And it was this envy and these, these high ecclesiastics that caused the persecution. They felt threatened by the power and the influence of this newborn body called the church. And they, they, they didn't like it at all. The apostles had de defied orders to keep silent. And they had been said, speak no more in this name. And they just kept on talking. And, and so they were very angry. So they put them in prison. And your point number two, supernaturally the prisoners were released and ordered to resume witnessing in the temple. <laughs> by God, you see. Acts 5, 19, the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go. Brother, when an angel says go, it's about time to get moving. Go, stand, speak in the temple to the people, all the words of this life. And, and when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought forth. When the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and said, saying, The prison truly found me shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no man therein. That's what you call surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, no man therein. Now, this was the first, but not the last, divine deliverance of the early church. God sent an angel to open those prison doors. God had control over both spiritual and physical forces. This divine deliverance freed the apostles to go back and witness as they were before. They were able to declare the life-giving action of the power of the Holy Ghost to the people not only that lived in Jerusalem, but those that had come in from the other areas. The apostles made an immediate return to the temple. At daybreak, they began preaching. They were not uh, late sleepers. And they, they began to preach and teach in, in, the, in the vast temple area. They could hold hundreds of thousands of people. They could have run away, but they didn't. Their loyalty to Jesus Christ meant more than just safety. They, they chose to obey God rather than man, and that put a steel backbone inside of them that they just would not bow to, 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 human, to human forces when God had spoken. The apostles were flogged, and then they were set free. And, and uh, they accepted this 
and said, we are ready to keep on doing what God wants us to do. In Acts 5, 24, it says, Now when the high priests and the captains of the, of the temple and the chief priests, brother, they really got a bunch together there. Look at all the different, you know, different high offices that we're talking about here. When they heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. <laughs> you could just hear them like going today. How big is this thing going to get? Are these careless men it's going to take the whole world over? You know, what's going to happen to us? Are we going to have to close our doors? Well, they had the same problem 2,000 years ago. It's an old problem. And, and so they said, how big will this thing become? What's going to happen to all of us? And then came one and told them, saying, behold, the men whom ye put in prison are, say are, are. they are standing in the temple, and they are teaching the people. And, and the captain of the guards went with the officers and, and brought them without violence, for they feared the people. They had so many so many people that loved this until they, 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 they feared the people. Thus they should have been stoned. The people would have had a, an insurrection right there in the streets. Uh, so the crowd was gathered and, and on the side of the apostles. And they could have easily have caused a riot, but they made no resistance whatsoever. In Acts 5 and 27 it says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? You can see those long whiskered gentlemen uh, speaking with such rustic authority. They had been around so long. And behold, ye filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. <laughs> can you see them bow over it? Yeah. Filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. They were still afraid of Jesus, you see. They were still afraid of the one that they had nailed to the cross. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. That was setting things straight. The high priest accused the apostles of filling Jerusalem with their doctrine. They were charged with spreading their teaching. And the religious leaders realized the believers were putting the responsibility for Jesus' death right straight on them where it should be. It was right straight on them. So that was the first mighty, mighty deliverance. Now as the group was growing and increasing on, verse, uh, on, on page 41, uh, they, they, they had to do something. They had to create some offices in the church. After the persecution and the deliverance described in our, in our lesson, we find that the church grow, kept growing. But all was not peace and all was not contentment because they were human. We must not forget that an increase in numbers brings an increase in human responsibility. How many understand that? Yeah, if you want to have 50 people in a church, you got one, one set of problems. If you've got 5,000, you've got another set of problems altogether. I mean, you understand that. And so, and so, so many humans around that these rough spots began to come forward. And God's will for the believers is to keep us all filled with the Spirit. So let's look here in, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom ye may appoint over this business. So now they were getting some church officers going, getting some church organization going. You say, what had happened there? At, at some time later, when they got through praising God and shouting and rejoicing because of all the hundreds of thousands that had gotten blessed and saved, it says there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews the, the, uh, that lived, that were born there. In Acts chapter 6 and 1, it says, in those days when the number of the, of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. They had all things in common. Everybody ate from the same pots, you know, and they said that their, their, that their widows had been neglected because they, were, they had come from across and they were from the area in Greece. And so certain widows were neglected. The multiplication of believers had increased responsibilities upon the little group. Sometimes you have to do things that are not spiritual, you know. Uh, you, you have to feed people, uh, and which is physical. And so it threatened their spiritual unity. Uh, that, that disunity could have caused the, the body of Christ to disintegrate right there if they hadn't taken a hold of it. The apostles did not feel it was right for them to neglect their preaching to handle these problems. Uh, there's a whole sermon there for you. That, that when a minister thinks he's got to sweep the floors and clean the, and clean the church and wipe off the pews and, 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 and all of this, he's not going to preach good sermons, I can tell you that right now. 
And so there comes a time when others have to find their place in the body. And then we all have to find our place in the body. And we all have different kind of gifts. One man can't do what another man can do and do it well. And so we start finding our place in the body. And they, in the first church in Jerusalem, they had to discover that. They had to discover there had to be some organization. So in verse 2, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now that was good spiritual thinking, wasn't it? A lot of preachers haven't found that out even until today. But it's still in the word of the Lord. That he, they, they said, now wait a minute, this isn't reasonable, that we stop studying the Word of God and preach the Word of God and, 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 and start serving tables here. So the apostles were, number one, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That, that, that's, that's beautiful. And they called the people to consider the problem. That's democratic. You know, call the people together to talk about it. They could not leave their ministry in order to do that which is carnal and natural. Uh, that it wasn't reasonable for men of mighty miracles to step back into the natural realm and to do those things. So a word of wisdom came forth in Acts 6 and 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Well, that was a real democratic situation. They had all these thousands of members in that church, and, and, and the apostles spoke up and told the brethren to do it, you know, the church people to do it. So you, you, you look out among yourself. Find seven men. It wasn't enough men, I don't think. But anyway, start with seven. And these men had to have an honest report. They had to be good, conscientious people. They had to be full of the Holy Ghost, which was very necessary. They had to be full of wisdom that we may appoint over this business. And then verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The great thing you need to learn there is your place in God. Some of us are anointed and blessed to keep a place like this clean, you see. Others are anointed and blessed to teach the Word of the Lord, and each should know their, their calling. Can you say amen? So they said, look up qualified men. Great. Make, make, make sure they're genuine. Great. Th they must be men of honest report. It's the only kind of people you need in position in a church. See that they are full of the Holy Ghost. If you don't have that, the church will die. And they must be full of wisdom. They must be people of ability, not nincompoops. People that know how to treat people and people know how to organize things, and if they don't, then, then you still won't will have your problems. And so, in Acts 6 and 5, it says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, you see? And they, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and they chose Philip, and they chose Pro, uh, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, or Timon, and, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, and whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they, they, they still prayed over to be sure they were doing the right thing. And when they, when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. So the apostles gave, gave full time of, of their time to the one thing that Jesus Christ had called them to do, and that was to pray and, and to have the anointing of God upon them, and the teaching and the preaching of the Word. And the whole group, the whole body, the whole church. And they were pleased with the, with the apostles' proposal. Therefore, they chose these men, full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, to serve as deacons. Now, I'd like to tell you something very strong. Uh, man might choose you to be a deacon, and God might choose you to be a teacher or an evangelist or, or a, a prophet or even an apostle, you see. And, and so, what man chooses for you to do and what God chooses for you to do might be two different things. And, and you just have to be humble about it. And, and, and oftentimes, God sees your faithfulness. Uh, like Norville Hayes says of himself, he says that for seven years, he, he worked in the ministry of helps. He said he would just go help anybody, just, just wherever they needed help. He'd go to jail and preach to the prisoners there. Uh, he, he'd go to the little hungry babies and hand out food to the little babies. and Just, just wherever you wanted him. He's been here in, in our midst and sit and talk to Bible school students all night long, uh, go out and pray for people, and just anything anybody asked him to do, he'd fly clear to California just to stand at the table back there and sell books in my meetings, you see. Uh, but then God looked upon his faithfulness and said, I have a little something special for you. And laid upon him anointing until today his name is known all over this land and, and in many other lands, you, you see. And, and so you can begin as one thing and, and, and finish as something else. 
And because you're beginning at a certain place, doesn't mean that's the end of you. It doesn't mean that's where you're going to terminate your life. But if you're not willing, you know, to begin somewhere, then God can't use you at all. And the problem with some people, they want to start at the top because they believe they belong at the top. I have one word for you. If you belong at the top, you'll be nowhere but the top. And if you don't belong there, don't scratch other people. They're not to blame for it. The Bible says it is God that gives promotion. Uh, in, in, my, in my meetings all over America, one of the biggest questions asked is, what, what is the position of an assistant pastor in a church? You know, these young men become assistants, and, and, and they're like a wild horse. Man, they want to take over this and take over that. They wish the pastor would die really and get him out of the way. And, 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 um, and I have to tell them, I said, now, wait a minute. It was, Elisha was 10 years washing Elijah's hands. The Bible says he, he, he washed Elijah's hands. He, he poured water on his hands. And, and he was faithful there. He, he was not unfaithful. He didn't run off and quit. He, he didn't say, I, I don't like being a second, a second fiddle here. And he just stayed in there with it. And finally, when the time came for the big move, he said, I want twice what you've got, young man. And God said, well, you can just have it. You've been faithful for 10 years, you can just have it. The biggest problem uh, with, with humans is they won't be faithful where God put them right now. And because you're not faithful there, God cannot promote you. And you, you want to win souls in Africa, but you don't care anything about the souls next door. And God can't send you to Africa. You don't belong there. Until you can win the souls next door, you don't need to go anywhere. Amen. All right. All right. Now, 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 this is the setup of the church. And the church has to change a lot. You know, we, we're still in the same body, we're still in the same church, we're still moving in, in the same way. And, and so we've got to recognize this, and every one of you here, and all of you that are watching, you've got to find your place in God. And if your church says, sweep the floor, that may be all right. You don't know what you're going to learn doing that. You might get to meet the, the best person in the world walking down the aisle, and you might get a promotion you've never dreamed about. We don't know which direction promotion is coming from, so let's keep looking all four ways. Are you here? Yeah. All right. Better organization helped the church to spread the word. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 it says, And the word of God increased, because everybody stayed in the right place, you see. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. How do you like that next word? Greatly. And the, and, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Why? They had set some sensible organization in effect. And, and they'd start a little doing things right. You, you can't beat doing things right. And, and if you're going to do things loosely, and if everybody's going to do what's right in his own eyes, you're going to have chaos. Uh, you, you, you can only have chaos. So let's find our place, and let's be humble about it, and work hard there, work so hard, until God says, hey, you need, uh, you need ex a little exaltation here. Uh, you, you need to uh, uh, move up a little higher. And it's only God that can do it. And so it says that the disciples greatly multiplied in Jerusalem, and, and a great company of the priests. Hey, that was an inroads. That was an inroads, wasn't it? And a great company of the priests. Brother, they got out of the hierarchy. They, 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 they got into the blessing. They got into the flow of God. They were sincere there, and when they found something to really be sincere about it, they got into it. Are you here? All right. And so... A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Man, that's one of the greatest verses in the whole Bible. Yeah, the Word of God increased. How many, how many are glad when the Word of God increases? It says right there in verse 7, the Word of God increased. Thank God. You know, we got so many increases in our world that we live in, organization and, and psychology classes and, you know, a whole lot of things that are increasing. But it says here, the Word of God increased. The Word of God increased. The Word of God increased. <laughs> you get the Word of God, faith cometh by hearing the Word, you see. And, and so faith began to multiply. Strength began to come. Authority began to come in the lives of the people because the Word of God increased. All right. The number of the disciples multiplied. Who likes a dead thing? Who likes to go to a place where they've been 14 for 14 years? You see. Uh, the number of the disciples multiplied. A great company of the religious leaders backed off of the denominationalism and got into the blessing of God and got into the power of God. Man, that's a great day. That is a great day. 
God sets leaders in the church. Jesus himself ordered the pattern of unity in the church. And this is what it is. You know it very well. It's in Ephesians 4 and 11. And it says that Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. And then in the next verse, he tells you why he gave these as gifts to the church, that these are gifts to the body of Christ. He says, these gifts are given to you for the perfecting of the saints. And so God didn't give them anything to decorate themselves with. He didn't give them anything to wear a halo over. He gave it to them for the perfecting of the saints. So the gift that God gave to the church was not for the men that had the gift. It was for the people. It was for the people in the body. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work, for the work, for the work, for the work of the ministry. The ministry is work. All evangelism is, is hard work. All growth of the body of Christ is hard work. For the work of the ministry. And then it says very beautifully, for the edifying. The word edifying comes from the word edifice. This building is an edifice. And, and so they, uh, 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 an edifice is something that's built up. And so they are given for the building up of the body of Christ, the edifying of the body. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God under the perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So although the apostles selected the elders who managed the church, the fine authority and the supreme head of the church was God, always will be. In Acts 8, 14, 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord on whom they believed, committed them to the Lord on whom they believed. So a spiritual need arose in the church. A condition developed which was carnal and was creating disunity and causing division. And God was interested in this for he, it threatened his church and the body of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so God's watchmen, who were the apostles, took immediate note of the situation. He guided the people by setting forth the qualifications of the men to be chosen. And they reserved to themselves the actual official dedication to their own work. And so we have the growth of the body. Now, the only reason and purpose for studying history, you know, is that you and I shall understand how to operate God's church today. This is the way we do it. And when, we, when you do it this way, you have the same results, you know, the, the, the multiplication of the body and, and, and the mighty miracles of healing. Aren't those beautiful things? Great multiplication of the body and mighty miracles of healing. God certainly wants these to take place in, in our lives. Father, we thank you for these that know and know that they know. And we thank you for these that learn and can use that wisdom in, in so many ways. So bless them and strengthen them and use each one of us to bring back the king whose name is Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. give the Lord a hand everybody. The message you have just heard is now available in audio and video. An audio tape is yours for a gift of any amount and a videotape for a gift of $20 or more. Please mention the program number on your screen and communicate with us by phone or mail.